Hi Year 12, this is our final video for the topic of sequences and series and in this video we're going to look at geometric series. So this is what we've covered so far. The difference between a sequence and a series, sigma notation, arithmetic sequences, arithmetic series and geometric sequences. So just like arithmetic sequences and series, when we add the terms in a geometric sequence, we get a geometric series. So let's look at the formula for the sum of a geometric series. We actually get two versions of it. We get this one here, sum of n terms is equal to a multiplied by r to the n minus 1 in brackets, all over r minus 1. Or we get this version, sum of n terms is equal to a, and this time we have 1 minus r to the power of n in brackets, all over 1 minus r. Now typically we use this first formula when r is greater than 1 or less than negative 1. And we use this one when r is in between negative 1 and 1. But it doesn't really matter. It's purely for ease of calculations. Here's our first example. Find the sum of the first nine terms of the series 32 plus 16 plus 8 plus dot dot dot. So we start off by saying, well, a, the first term is 32. And the common ratio is 16 divided by 32, which is a half, and n is equal to 9. All right, let's choose this version of the sum formula, so the one with 1 minus r to the power of n, because r is a fraction. See that? It's in between negative 1 and 1. So substituting in, I've just changed that to 0.5 for space reasons. You probably would still continue with a half. So 32 in brackets, 1 take away 0 0.5 to the power of 9, all over 1 take away 0 0.5, straight into the calculator. And here's our answer, 63.875. Example 2. So now we're in sigma notation. So we'll start off by generating the first couple of terms in the series. So putting in 1, we get 3 times 2 to the power of 0. 2 to the power of 0 is 1. Our first term is 3. Now let's put 2 in. 3 times 2 to the power of 1, well that's 6. And then putting in 3, 3 times 2 to the power of 2, so 2 squared is 4, 4 threes are 12. Okay, so from this we can see that a is equal to 3, r is equal to 2, and n is equal to 8. Now this time we're going to use the other version of the formula, the one with the r's at the front. And let's substitute in. And into the calculator, we get 765. And example three, how many terms of the geometric series 1 plus 3 plus 9 plus 27 are needed to give a sum of 1093? So a is equal to 1, and r is equal to 3 divided by 1, which is 3. And we don't know n. So substituting in, we get a is 1, r is 3 to the power of n take away 1 all over 3 minus 1 is equal to 1093. Right On the denominator here we have 2, so let's take that over the other side. So 3 to the power of n take away 1 is equal to 2186. Now add 1 to both sides. 3 to the power of n is equal to 2187. And taking logs of both sides we get log of 3 to the power of n is equal to log 2187. And our third log law means we can bring this n down the front. And dividing both sides by log 3, we end up with n is equal to log 2187 divided by log 3 straight into the calculator. Don't try and work these out and abbreviate them, so do it straight all in one go. Our answer is 7. Okay, let's move on. Some geometric series have a limiting sum. That means if you add all the terms that there are up to infinity, there is a ceiling or a wall that you won't get past. Okay, there's some sort of limit to the sum. Now, what do you think is the condition for this? So have a look at these two, these two geometric series there. Which one do you think has a limiting sum? Can you see that this one is blowing out? It's getting bigger, 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 bigger. So if we ever managed to get to infinity, these terms would be equal to infinity. So this one is not going to have a limiting sum. But this one is because we're halving 
each term each time. So they're getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So this is the one that has the limiting sum. And here's the rule, a geometric series has a limiting sum if the common ratio is between negative 1 and 1. And this is how we can write it, as negative 1 is less than r is less than 1, or like this. This is a better way to write it. This means the absolute value of r, so strip the negative off if it exists, is less than 1. So basically r has to be a fraction in between negative 1 and positive 1. So coming back to our formula here, we are going to use the formula that starts with the 1 because we've got r in between negative 1 and 1. But how do we work this out? What is the limit as n approaches infinity of this thing? So let's just take a detour for a minute. We've covered limits like this. The limit as x approaches 2 of x squared minus 4 all over x minus 2. Now hopefully you remember, we can't just substitute the 2 in. This will give us 2 squared take away 4, which is 0, over 2 minus 2, which is 0, and 0 divided by 0 is undefined. And in fact, what we do is factorise the numerator. These two now cancel out, and we can substitute in. Putting the 2 in here, we get 2 plus 2, which is 4. So the limit of this function as x approaches 2 is 4. But what about limits to infinity? I mean, what is the answer to this? What is the limit as x approaches infinity of 1 plus 1 on x? Well, this leads us to a really important identity. The limit as x approaches infinity of 1 on x is equal to 0. This actually makes sense. If we were able to substitute infinity in here, 1 divided by infinity, what does that mean? How many times does infinity go into 1? infinity is too big to go into any number, so it's zero. Now, if I can just do some dodgy maths here, I'll further demonstrate this. Remember how we said one divided by zero tends towards infinity. Well, suppose we treat that like an equation and switch them around. One divided by infinity approaches zero. So back to our question here then, what is this? The limit as x approaches infinity of 1 plus 1 on infinity, that's 0. So the limit of this is 1. And this is actually a hyperbola, isn't it? In fact, if we graphed it, it'd look like this. What's happening as x is heading off towards infinity? What's happening to y? The curve's coming down, 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 and it is approaching 1. So remember when we worked out the vertical and horizontal asymptotes for a hyperbola? You guys were really good at the vertical asymptotes. You would look here and say, well, x minus 1 cannot be equal to 0. x can't be equal to 1. That's the vertical asymptote. But you always struggled a little bit with the horizontal one. I used to say to you, well, this can never equal 0, so y can't equal 3. Well, this is y y is equal to the limit as x approaches infinity of our function. Like this is almost identical to the last question. What is this? As x approaches infinity, 3 is okay, it doesn't have an x in it, minus 1 divided by infinity take away 1. Well, that's still infinity. There's our 1 divided infinity. This is 0. So our limit is 3. That's our horizontal asymptote. y is equal to 3. Now, just before we go back to our sequences and series, I want to teach you this because it kind of fits in. Sometimes you might be asked to do a really strange question like this. Find the limit as x approaches infinity of 3x squared plus x plus 1 all over x squared minus 2. Now, we've no idea what that graph looks like. So we're kind of wanting to find a horizontal asymptote for something that we don't even know what it looks like. But there's a really sneaky trick for this. What we're going to do is divide all of the terms by the highest power of x. So the highest power of x is x squared. So I'm going to do 3x squared divide x squared. x divide x squared. 1 divide x squared. x squared divide x squared. And negative 2 divide x squared. Like this. I've tidied them up a bit. 3x squared divide x squared is 3. x divide x squared is 1 on x. 
Okay, what happens when I substitute in infinity now, or pretend to? The three is okay. This becomes plus zero, plus zero, all over one, take away zero. So the limit as x approaches infinity of this function is three. Okay, detour over. Let's return to where we were. Sum to infinity is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of a in brackets 1 minus r to the n all over 1 minus r. Now this a over 1 minus r doesn't have an n in it, so it's unaffected by this. I'm going to bring it out the front. So our question reduces to this. What is the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 minus r to the n? Now you're probably telling me, well hang on a minute, r to the power of infinity is infinity, so this thing doesn't have a limit. But remember that r is a fraction, it's in between negative 1 and 1. For example, it could be a half. Now what is a half to the power of infinity? Well, 1 to the power of anything is 1, and this denominator will be 2 to the power of infinity, which is infinity, and 1 divide infinity is 0. So that is gone. And the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 is just 1. So here's our formula. The sum to infinity is equal to a over 1 minus r. Okay, here's the formulas on the reference sheet. So under the topic of sequences and series, you get the nth term of an arithmetic sequence, two versions of the sum of n terms of an arithmetic series, the nth term of a geometric sequence, two versions of the sum of n terms of a geometric series, and the sum to infinity. And you can see how we have this qualifier here. The absolute value of r must be less than 1. Here's example one. Find the sum to infinity of the series one plus a half plus a quarter plus an eighth. So we can see that a is equal to one and r is equal to a half. Here's our formula. We substitute in and we get two. And this is actually the answer to this joke. Remember I showed you this when we were learning about calculus. An infinite number of mathematicians walk into a bar. The first one orders a beer. The second one orders a half a beer. The third one orders a quarter of a beer, and the barman says you're all idiots and pours two beers. Example two, find a geometric series with common ratio one on P, which has one over one minus P as its limiting sum. Now we don't know what the first term is, but we do have a common ratio and we know the limiting sum. So we're gonna use this formula. So the limiting sum is one divided by one minus P a we don't know, r is 1 on p. Okay, let's tidy this up so that we have a common denominator. So make this into p over p. So I end up with a over p take away 1 on p. And we've got double decker fractions here. So this is a divided by p minus 1 on p, which is the same as a times p on p minus 1. So make sure that makes sense to you. Now, it would be easy to cross multiply here and to expand and then to try and factorize, but there's a much easier way. These two things are actually equal to one another, except they're opposite in sign. Now let's just have a look what I'm talking about. So if I take my one minus P and turn it around, that's the same as negative P plus one. Now, if I factorize the negative out, I end up with this. So have a look, P minus one, and 1 minus p, can you see? They are equal to one another, except that this one is the negative of this. So I'm going to do this. Okay, does that make sense? And we're going to float this negative up to the numerator. And so now that the denominators are the same, the numerators must be equal. In other words, ap must equal negative 1. And so a is equal to negative 1 on p. Now all we need to do is find a geometric series that has this as the first term and a common ratio of 1 on p. So here's an example. Negative 1 on p, then multiplying by 1 on p gives me negative 1 on p squared, and multiplying again gives me negative 1 on p cubed. 
So there's our series. And last question. Find the limiting sum of the geometric series 2 plus 2 all over root 2 plus 1 plus 2 all over root 2 plus 1 all squared. And so A, the first term, is equal to 2. And R, we can find that by doing second term divided by the first term, which is 1 all over root 2 plus 1. Now, we don't need to rationalise the denominator. I mean, in the question, the denominators aren't rational, but it will help our algebra if we do. So let's multiply top and bottom by root 2 minus 1. Across the top, we get root 2 minus 1. And on the bottom, we get 2 take away 1, which is 1. So our common ratio is root 2 minus 1. Into the formula, we get 2 over 1 take away root 2 minus 1 in brackets. And tidying up this denominator, we get 2 all over root 2. Now, I know that if we rationalise the denominator here, it will simplify. So let's do that. 2 times root 2 all over 2. Those 2s will cancel out. And our limiting sum, our answer, is root 2. Part 2. Explain why the geometric series 2 plus 2 all over root 2 minus 1 plus 2 all over root 2 minus 1 all squared does not have a limiting sum. Now, here's the thing. The formula doesn't know if the series should have a limiting sum or not. It'll work. If you substitute a and r into your formula, sum is equal to a over 1 minus r, you're going to get an answer. But it's meaningless if our common ratio is greater than 1 or less than negative 1. So that's what this question is actually asking. What is the common ratio? So let's work out r. Term 2 divided by term 1. That gives us 1 all over root 2 minus 1. And in the calculator, that's approximately equal to 2.414, which is greater than 1. So this is why this geometric series doesn't have a limiting sum. Okay, that's it for this topic. If you want to continue on with the next topic that would be in this strand, that would be financial mathematics. And the very first video in that topic is compound interest.